thank you guys for all coming today. I know PT's not here, so those of you who knew that and came for the discount sermon anyway, I appreciate it. <laughs> you guys get the blue light special clearance rack preach to, preaching today. <laughs> I'll be honest, guys. When PT said he wasn't going to be here and said he needed someone to fill in, he put it, put it on the group me, and my first response was to just type, I'll do it without even thinking. And as soon as I did it, there was this little voice in my head that went, what, what are you doing? Why? Why would you volunteer first? What's the matter with you? You've already been made to do this one time. Do you not remember how stressful that was? Why would you do it again? And it's like there was this, there were two of me. There was one that was like apologizing and one that was yelling at the other me. Like, stop, what is, you're stupid. I'm, I'm sorry, you should be. And I was hoping, hoping that someone would step in and say, oh, it's okay, I'll do it, I'll take over, and hoping that I could just back out of it. But everyone's like, oh, thanks, Jake, we appreciate you for doing that. I'm like, yeah, uh huh, great, thanks. So now, <laughs> so now I was racking my brain trying to come up with a topic. And it's hard because while I'm trying to think of something to preach about, I'm still struggling with life and personal issues and sin and family drama and work-related stuff that everybody else does. Life doesn't stop because you're trying to think of some, a topic to preach about. Satan doesn't care if you're going to preach. Actually, he does care because then he starts zeroing in and attacking you harder. Anytime you're going to be doing something for God, Satan's going to hit you with everything he's got to try to discourage you and keep you from rising to the challenge. I think Jim can back me up on that. Keith, too. Yeah. <sighs> but God just sits back and says, relax, I got this. I got you. You're not alone in this. God uses Satan's attacks to show you where your weakest areas lie, and he shows you how to overcome them. For me, and I think for many of us these last few weeks that I've noticed, um, that our problem we struggle with most of us, we most of us struggle with, is we often get what I call spiritual burnout. You come to church on Sunday, you sing, you worship God, you listen to the sermon, you listen to the uplifting message, and you're suddenly empowered, you're excited to get back to get out there and start living for God and doing what he wants you to do and doing everything you're called to do, right? Your spirits are lifted and anything seems possible. Then you leave here, you get cut off by someone in traffic, you burn your dinner for the night, your kid mouths off, you lose your temper with them and feel guilty, you get a bad night's sleep, you oversleep, you're late to work, one thing after another just seems to go wrong. You try to remember God's word, but you feel discouraged and defeated. By Wednesday night, when by, you come here and you're still enthusiastic, optimism that things are gonna get better keeps you just chugging along, but by Saturday, you're just glad the week is over and you just want to forget it and start again. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Hmm? Jesus promised us victorious lives, joyful lives. But how often do we experience that victory, that joy? Life gets on our way and we lose hope. God's word is full of promises, assurance, comforting words, hope, and such like to help us get through these tough times. But how often do we really stand on them? Do we really believe them? James said faith without works is dead. That true faith results in action, a changed life. PT once told me there's a distinction between saving faith and living faith, what we call it. Saving faith happens once when you accept Jesus as your savior. It lasts forever. God counts you as saved and seals you in Christ for eternity and vows to never let you go or leave you. Living faith, on the other hand, is a day-to-day -day battle a choice to listen to God and use what he says as the source of our strength to live our lives. Our saving faith is preserved by God, but living faith depends in part on us and our choice to trust God daily or not. The Bible refers to the act of living faith in different ways, walking in the light, abiding in Christ, sharing in the divine nature. It's all the same thing, really. I kind of like the sound of doing that. I kind of want to do that more, wouldn't you? Does the Bible give us any clue on how to do that successfully? Yes! It does! Praise God. I'm amazed how often God uses farming, planting, agricultural terms in his word to describe how we're to live. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. I am the vine, you are the branches, etc. Right? You can clearly see parallels between living by faith or having faith with plant life, plant growth. Plant cultivation. What do plants need to live? Water, for starters. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 says, For the ground that has drunk the rain that has fallen often on it, and that produces vegetation useful to those it is cultivated for, receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless 
and about to be cursed and will be burned at the end. Land that is watered often becomes fertile and grows fruit. So if we want living faith and the joy and victory that comes with it, we need to have our faith watered. Hmm. What did Jesus offer the woman at the well? She came and asked for it. And he, what did he ask her? He said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again, ever. In fact, the water that I will give him will become a well of water springing up within him for eternal life. John 4, 14. And again, in John 6, 38 to 39, he says, the one who believes in me as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit. Water gives life. The Spirit gives life. Interesting. The Spirit is the one who gives life. It says in John 6, 63, the flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Wait a minute. Hold the phone. So if the Spirit gives life and is living water for us and God's Word is the Spirit and life, then we need God's Word in us. Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, verse 17. He said, sanctify them by the truth. Your Word is truth. Whoa, hold the phone again. Hold on a second. God's word is spirit and life and water and truth. PT told me I need to be more expressive when I'm preaching, so. (laughs) Naturally, I'm being a wise guy and going overboard. (laughs) I'm gonna get you guys in on it in a second. What are we supposed to be letting it do to us? What are we supposed to be letting God's word do to us? Sanctify us. Say the word with me. Sanctify. Say it again. Sanctify. Louder. Sanctify. Again. Sanctify. And one more time for PT. Sanctify. (laughs) Oh, boy. I'm going to catch it in the neck for that when he comes back. (laughs) God is calling us to be sanctified. If we want victory, if we want joy, if we want to be full of the Spirit, if we want to be encouraged and comforted and have power to live godly lives and overcome the struggles we face every day, then we need living faith. Living faith comes from being watered with living water. Living water is full of the Spirit. Living water is the Word of God, and we need to be sanctified by it. We need God's Word to sanctify us. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you will be able to discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Mm-hmm. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, it says, You took off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. And finally, in chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 1, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. God commands us to imitate him, to put off our old selves, be transformed into his likeness. In return, we will have peace that surpasses understanding, joy in all circumstances, and life abundantly. This all happens through the process of sanctification. My two favorite books in the New Testament are Ephesians and Colossians. I always find encouragement from God in these two books. I can just open them and they're full of promises and encouragements and hope and just lifts my spirits when I'm feeling discouraged and it gives me the zeal to go back out and keep trying. Ironically, these two books are the only two I could find in the New Testament. There is writ there, Paul wrote, no correction, criticism, or admonishment to these churches. These two, um, there are, the, the church that they're addressed to have no, not the, Paul's not telling them they did anything wrong. They were doing everything they're supposed to do right, and I almost never do anything right. The church in Colossae especially seemed like they were doing everything they were supposed to, to the point that Paul's like applauding them. Good job, guy. You got, you're on point. I got no problems with you guys. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. We can look at Colossians 1, verses 3 through 5, where he says, We always thank God 
the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. They had faith in Christ and love for others. Why? Because of hope. Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. They woke up every day and chose to believe God's promise of salvation for them was true. They chose to believe that God's love for them was real. That they'd been forgiven for their sins once and for all. And that Jesus was coming to take them to heaven one day. They knew that. They were confident in that. The hope, the confidence they received from these promises produced joy in their hearts, which naturally flowed out as love for others and obedience to God. Notice the connection between believing God's promises and a victorious life lived for God by faith. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind according to the truth. When your thoughts align with what God says is true, you're allowing God to sanctify you to change your mind, to change your attitude, your outlook. You choose to listen to what God says, to stand on it, claiming it as truth. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. God gives the promise that we are his children through faith in Christ, and he dearly loves us. That's awesome. He uses that as the motivation to spur us on to being like him. You are dearly loved children, therefore imitate me. The action on our part, the change, the obedience comes in response to the promise, the assurance and the hope that we are his children. Our victory and godliness always comes as a response to being sanctified. And our sanctification comes as a result of knowing his promises and assurances to us and standing on them. 1 John 4.19 says we love because he first loved us. We love in response to God loving us. Let's be honest. We tend to be in more loving, generous, charitable moods when we're feeling confident of God's love and forgiveness for us, don't we? Puts us in a good mood. When I'm confident in God's love and grace for me, when I'm believing that Jesus is with me, he's pleased with me, he sees me as his son, and he's going to use me for his glory, I'm on cloud nine. It is very, very hard to irritate me or get me in a bad mood when I'm feeling like that. I'm able to laugh off things that would normally get upset me. When you're focused on and believing God's grace toward us is active and real, you gain power. And I'm generally more inclined to go out of my way to help others when I'm confident in God's love and acceptance and grace toward me. Paul says this is exactly how this happens, how it works when he wrote to the church in Ephesus. Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. He says, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened in the inner man with power through his Holy Spirit that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love, and to know the Messiah's love, <coughs> and surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I found recently the benefits of doing, um, when I do Bible study, study the origins of words, the, what is it, etymology? You learn about what the roots mean, what they meant in their original languages. Very useful. Knowing what they mean it helps to paint a clearer picture of what God was trying to say. When Paul prayed the Ephesians would be rooted and firmly established in God's love, the Greek words used here, are, and forgive me for my pronunciation, the words here used are erizomenoi, which means to root, to plant, or cause to take root. And tethameliomenoi, which means lay a foundation. Don't laugh, Jim. I don't speak Greek, okay? <laughs> means lay a foundation. Essentially, not to, to not move, basically, is what he's saying. Don't move from God's love. Don't move from your confidence and assurance of God's love for you. The opposite of these two words would be medikinomenoi which means to dislodge or to stir to a place elsewhere. I see you. Interestingly, the same words are used in contrast to one another in Second Peter verse 5 through 9. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, endurance, endurance with godliness, brotherly affection, 
Here's where the word metakinomenoi, being moved, was used. It says, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. The person who is not growing in godliness, not being sanctified, has moved away, forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. Our energy, our power to live rightly and follow God comes from the spirit, from the truth. We're having living water inside of us. When we find ourselves feeling discouraged or we're caught in persistent sin, our tendency is to look inward to ourselves and wonder what's wrong with us. When we do that, Satan uses that as the opening to shove guilt and depression and anxiety and a sense of deep defeat and doubt into our minds and weigh us down. The solution is to get our minds off of ourselves. We've moved away from our true and correct focus. There's nothing wrong with us other than that we're sinners, obviously. That's normal for everyone. The true power to change doesn't come from us. It comes from God. Remember he said the flesh doesn't help at all. Power comes from the spirit. You're feeling discouraged. You're feeling defeated. You're caught in sin because you stopped looking at the truth. You need to turn your eyes back to God's word, to the truth. Jesus, he supplies the motivation and the strength by giving love, grace, encouragement. That is where your power to live godly lives comes from. Remind me of one of the songs we sing here. Um, the opening line says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's it. Hey. Be on it today. Nice. I love the words of this psalm because of how hopeful they are. God promises that as we focus on Christ, we will find peace that surpasses understanding, find rest for our souls, freedom from worry. I also love this song and the verses it's derived from because of how instructive they are for our daily living. They tell us what our focus should be on. What's our focus supposed to be on? Yeah, Jesus, thank you. As a result, sorry, yeah, that's right. And as a result, we will begin to desire him more. And the things of this world, we will desire less. And as a result, we will sin less. So we have a promise of peace, a promise of growth, and an instruction on how to take hold of those promises all in one verse. Is it a verse? That? Would it be considered a verse? I don't know. Stanza, maybe? Yeah, okay. Susan's not here to school me on music terminology, so... Oh, she will. I know. I know she will. <laughs> ah, goodness. But it's also a command. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. The same words, again, are echoed in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Sorry, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured the cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. This song, this verse, is a lesson on sanctification. It's a command to be sanctified. Peter could walk on water as long as he stayed looking at Jesus. He could do the impossible when he focused on Jesus, on the truth, but when he took his eyes off the truth and looked at the situation, his own weakness, his own sinfulness, his failure, his guilt, his situation around him, the dangers and the problems he had to deal with, he started to sink. <clears throat> Often, we don't experience the sanctified life that God calls us to. Philippians 4, verse 4 through 6 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Do we rejoice in the Lord always when we're dealing with family drama or problems at work or difficult situations? Do we refuse to worry? Do we trust that God will take care of us? Do we truly trust him on a personal level? Do we let our graciousness be known to everyone? Are we gracious when we're driving in traffic and people are, other drivers are being inconsiderate, or do we get mad at them, cut them off? 
Are we gracious when we go shopping, the supermarket, or letting people go ahead of us? Or do we race to get in line ahead of them or push people out the door or get around them because they're walking too slow and we've got places to be? When our kids are not listening, when coworkers get on our nerves, when strangers inconvenience us, when someone else is in need and we can sacrifice ourselves for their sake, do we? I was on my way to work one night last week. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning, 32 degrees outside. I was running behind. I was wearing two jackets, and I was still cold. I was pulling onto the freeway, apologizing to God for being late, asking him to help me get to work as quickly as possible because I knew I was going to be late to work. That's when off to the side of the road, I saw a homeless man walking in shorts with a blanket wrapped around him like a skirt. No other warm clothes on. I looked down and saw that I had a spare sweatshirt in my car. I could have pulled over. I could have gotten out, given him to him and said, hey, I want you to know Jesus Christ loves you and wants to be your Lord and Savior. Stay safe and stay warm out here, okay? And then gotten back in my car and gone to work. But I didn't. I was so concerned with getting to work on time, my own concerns of not getting in trouble with my boss that I just kept driving. I made it to work. I was only eight minutes late as opposed to 15 minutes late, what I would have been if I'd stopped and helped him. I didn't get in trouble, so that worked out great. But that man still had to go to sleep in a cold tent in 30-degree weather, no way to stay warm, and without knowing there was a Savior who loved him. I wish I had stopped. I failed to be gracious. I took my eyes off Jesus. I stopped allowing his word, the truth about what he says is what's important. I stopped letting him shape my attitude and agree with him, and I missed an opportunity to serve him. When we let God sanctify us by hearing his word and choosing to agree with him, we grow more like him in time. What he cares about starts to become more important to us. When we forget his promises, we forget that we've been cleansed from our sins and made his children. We stop believing his word. We get bogged down by life and we lose our source of spiritual power and sin becomes all too easy to fall into. Abraham, uh, Abraham trusted God enough to leave his home. But he didn't trust God to provide him provide for his family in Canaan during a famine, so he fled to Egypt. He didn't trust God to protect his life in Egypt, so he asked his wife Sarah to lie for him to keep him safe. He forgot God's promise. He forgot that God promised to, to give him a son to make him a great nation. And that led him to doubt God, and that led him to sin. But God was faithful to Abraham anyway, because he's gracious, right? And Abraham remembered God's love and forgiveness and faithfulness to him in that situation. And it was that remembering God's love that helped Abraham trust God later by being willing to sacrifice Isaac. Through that act of obedience, we were all blessed through Abraham. When we forget God's promises, we succumb to doubt and fear and guilt, and we sin. When we trust and remember God's promises, we're given confidence and strength to obey. <clears throat> David was overwhelmed with the burdens of ruling the kingdom of Israel. He forgot God's love. He forgot God's provision and his promise to preserve him. David grew lonely and pined for what he didn't have a right to take. He slept with Bathsheba and murdered her husband Uriah. And when God called him out on it, what did David say? Restore to me the joy of my salvation and give me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Psalm 51, 12 and 13. David forgot God's love, his salvation, and he fell into sin. <clears throat> when he asked to be restored to faith in God's word, he asked to be restored to his faith in God's goodness. God blessed him. God forgave David. And David was full of joy and spurred on to new levels of love and service for God. Our power to live joyfully and victoriously comes from being sanctified, comes from trusting God's word and promises to us. <clears throat> so what do we need for sanctification? If it's so important, what do we need to have it? Three things. First is knowledge. Second Peter 1, verse 3 through, uh, three through 5, sorry. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us 
very great and precious promises so that through them, through the promises, you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. God's promises give us power, give us, help us share in the divine nature. They're what changes us and influence us. If we want to grow in godliness, if we want to become more like Christ in our attitudes, our thoughts, it only makes sense we have to know what thinking like Christ means. We have to know what sorts of things Jesus thinks about or thought about while he was on earth. We have to increase our understanding of God. We have to have knowledge. If you find that you're not living the way God wants you to, perhaps it's because you've forgotten what God has promised you. You've lost your joy because you've forgotten the truth that made you joyful in the first place. You have to know God's word and what it says to you. Jesus said, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He said this when he was faced with temptation from Satan in the wilderness. Jesus knew how to defend himself and resist temptation because he'd spent 33-ish years increasing his knowledge through reading and study of the word of God. Tell me, if Jesus had to read and study and memorize scripture while being omniscient, how much do you think we should be doing it? A lot is the answer I was looking for. <coughs> Wake up, people. I'm not that bad, am I? Sheesh. <laughs> Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18. Do you know God's word to you? Do you know what it says? Do you know that what God promises is true of you if you are a Christian? It says you are chosen. You are holy and blameless to God. You are adopted and pleasing to him. It says in Ephesians 1. It says the Holy Spirit lives in you forever as God's seal of ownership and that you can never lose that. It can never be forfeited. You belong to God forever. <clears throat> Zephaniah says he rejoices over you with singing because he delights in you. Hebrews 13 says he will never leave you or forsake you. The story of the prodigal son tells you that when you sin or fail, God is running after you, chasing after you, running towards you with love and forgiveness to restore you. Because like Isaiah 30 says, he longs to be gracious and compassionate to you. In Romans 8, 37, he says, you are more than a conqueror in Christ who loves you. Do you believe that? Do you really trust that that's true in your day-to-day -day life? God's commands give us direction on how to live our lives, but his promises give us motivation to fulfill them. Without the motivation, we're just operating by the flesh and there's no power there. Know God's word and know what he says to you. Believe what he promises you. Bible intake is what you need first and foremost to gain knowledge. Bible intake. As a side note, and this is really difficult to do without accountability. I learned that. I think we can all say in the leadership journey, we've learned how important that is. So I encourage you guys to find someone to help hold you accountable to reading God's word every day, knowing it, keeping it hidden in your heart, keeping it in your mind. We're not meant to walk alone, but spur one another onward. What does it say? Pastor Tim always says the quarter three strands is not easily broken. We're supposed to be helping each other read and know God's word. <clears throat> Help each other. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, uh, now the second thing we need is meditation. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is any praise, Dwell on these things. Philippians 4, verse 8. Dwell on them. Think on them. Keep them with you. Joshua 1, verse 8 says, This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to recite it day and night, so you, will be, you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. <laughs> That's pretty great there. Jesus said his word is just as important as food. So we need to be eating of God's word as often as we eat our meals. How often do you guys eat a day? Do you eat more than once? No? You, eat, you don't eat more than once? You eat, you eat one time a day, really? 
No, I don't think he does. Six. Say it six times a day. That makes more sense. <laughs> <coughs> I love her laugh. We should be drinking of his word as often as we need a drink of water. You can't eat a big meal on Sunday and stay full the rest of the week. I can't eat a big meal and stay full for more than six hours. But merely reading God's word isn't enough. I learned this the hard way. In order to truly have God's word impact you, change you, we need to time in, spend, time, bleh, spend time in meditation. If reading the Bible is eating of his word, then meditation is chewing on it. What happens if you try to eat something without chewing it? <coughs> Doesn't go in, does it? That was a little over the top, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, merely hearing oh sorry so in the leadership journey we're reading a book called spiritual disciplines for the christian life i believe it's called by whitney and the chapter on meditation he says merely hearing or reading the bible for example can be like a short rainfall on hard ground regardless of the amount or intensity of the rain most runs off and little sinks in Conversely, meditation opens the soil of the soul and lets the water of God's word percolate deeply. The result is an extraordinary fruitfulness and spiritual prosperity. <clears throat> Anyone can say they believe that Jesus loves them, but how often does that affect your day? How often does it influence how you think and how you go throughout your life? How much do you really believe it? That, that is directly affected to how much you meditate on it. Take a moment to stop and think about Jesus' love for you today. He says his love for you is everlasting, unconditional. He loves you so much he would rather suffer and die in agony than be without you. He loves you so much he carried your guilt and sin away from you as far away as the east is from the west just so he could be with you. Do you believe that? The more you meditate on it, the easier it gets to believe and the greater impact it has on you. And the third thing we need finally is prayer. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. And 1 Thessalonians five seventeen says simply this, Pray constantly. Pray constantly. Prayer is the key to everything. It's the big shiny bow that ties everything else together. Prayer is how we take what God has told us through the Bible, through, told us through Bible intake, what we've internalized through meditation <clears throat> and put it into action in the real world. Prayer is the simplest act of faith you can do because it is how you express to God that you hear him and acknowledge him. And when you pray back to God what he's taught you, you're empowered by his spirit to believe what he says confidently. Remember the armor of God? Put on the full armor of God, right? The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Prayer is how you put your armor on. You claim what God says about, is true about you back to him. Thank you, God, that you are good. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you've saved me and forgiven my sins. Thank you that you're always with me and I'm never alone. Please help me to pray in all circumstances. Help me put off my old self and be renewed in my thoughts. <clears throat> Prayer is how we take hold of what God says to us and make it real. Maybe you have doubts. Maybe you're not confident or you, don't have the, you can't find the strength to believe what he says. That's okay. This is honestly one of my absolute, one of my personal favorite things about God is that he doesn't make you work the faith up on your own. He says you can ask him for faith. Ask him to help you believe. Remember the man who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Remember? Jesus helped him as soon as he asked. Peter doubted on the water and began to sink. And he cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me. What Peter did, what Jesus do? Sorry, Peter, you don't have faith in me. You're on your own. No. Praise God, no, immediately, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. I've got you. Don't be afraid. I'll help you. God is amazing. <clears throat> Ultimately, the goal of self, uh, sanctification is to grow in godliness and so grow closer to God himself. This isn't about following rules or keeping up appearances but having a living relationship with God as a person. God wants a relationship with you. He wants you to know him and his love for you. 
And he will absolutely help you to have that with him. He does so through the process of sanctification, giving knowledge through our Bible intake, intake, changing our minds through meditation, and helping us put our faith into action by expressing it through prayer. As we do this, as we get better at this process, God promises we can overcome any obstacle, bear any burden, and live with true victory and joy. Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3, says, How happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path of sinners, or join a group of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that bears its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Ask God to help you this week. Ask him to help you today, this morning. Ask him to give you that relationship with him. Ask him to sanctify you, to help you meditate and know his word and believe it. Ask him to give you a willing spirit and to restore the joy of your salvation so he may, he may serve him effectively. He is eager to do so. Father God, thank you that you desire us to be sanctified. You desire for us to be conformed to your image and that you've made it so we can have that power to be sanctified by knowing your word and knowing your love for us and knowing your promises to us. Father, life is hard and we can get distracted and we can forget what you say. Forgive us and remind us of your goodness. Remind us of who you are. Remind us of who we are in you, who you say we are. Help us find the joy that you promised us. Help us experience the victorious lives that you promised us. Help us do this so we may glorify you in everything we do, God. Help us to be sanctified so we may grow closer to you and love and worship you the way you deserve to be loved and worshipped. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.